Let's pray together. You can remain there. Father God, I'm grateful that you have an amazing word for us, Lord, because you're the one who communicates. You're the one who speaks to people's heart. You're the one who drops that word in our hearts. Father, I pray that our hearts being the good ground will be available for what you're going to deposit in us today, Lord God. May it give great fruit in every area of our life. I just pray for that today, Lord God, for each one of us, that our minds, our hearts are transformed to go into a better place, the place that you have for us, Lord God. And we are grateful, not just for our church, but for the many churches that are around the world and in our area in the Inland Empire, and we pray for them, Lord. This is a mission that we believe that you're advancing the gospel through them as well as us. So we pray for them, strengthen the pastors today, those who are sharing the word of God, Lord, that you would encourage them when they feel discouraged, that they're able to communicate your truth in every area. Father, And we pray a blessing over them because we're advancing one kingdom, and that is yours. We always say it because we believe so, so do it today. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say... Amen. Amen. And we've been uh, sharing this series on Sunday night called In Him. And uh, it's, a, it's a great, great series. We've learned so much uh, from different areas. Pastor Luke talked about righteousness and being restored in him through righteousness. And uh, Pastor Richard uh, shared a wonderful wor- uh, word about finding our identity in him. And Pastor Jim just brought us an amazing one, the benefits. I mean, it's just so much has been said um, in this pulpit about being in him. And this is so powerful because I thought when Pastor Nanny asked me, I said, there's so much already being said about the in him. I have no idea what I'm going to come up with and what God God has for us. But um, studying and praying, God led me to this one verse we're going to look at tonight. And it's so interesting because the verse, even though it is about in him, the direction was so different. Let me just tell you, we all have tools in our own lives, in our own, uh, you know, garage or whatever that are, have enough power to do a certain function. I remember many years ago, I bought a drill because it was cheap, but I didn't know about voltage. So this was a nine volt drill. Most of the guys are like, what? You know, they, they'll probably understand it's a little drill, but it was so cheap. It was like 20 bucks. I'm like, man, it's awesome. I need a drill to do things around the house until the first project came up. And so I pull out my tool, all, all you know, I'm going to get it. And I grab some screws. I'm going to go on the wall and I, ee, ee. And the thing would not, it was so lame. I was like, this is ridiculous. So I got all mad, you know. So I have a neighbor, well, he moved, but neighbor Alan, and he, he's like Pastor Luke. He loves working with wood, tons of tools in his garage. So I knock on the door, all humiliated. Hey, man, can I borrow your drill? And so he pulls out this powerful thing, 18 volt drill. Yeah, come on. He comes with me at the house. I mean, he just did everything so fast. And I was, I felt such a small man at that moment. So I went to Lowe's and bought a humongous 18 I said, forget I'm going to spend as much as it is because I need to feel powerful. I haven't used it since I bought it, but I have a you know, powerful tool in my garage. That's just wonderful. Uh, so a lot of times having power and having tools, we feel that way. We feel we want to utilize the power available for us to do a certain mission. A few years ago, I had a small car, and that uh, kind of the same thing. I had a small car, and uh, some of you guys know it's a four-cylinder car, so I live in Yucaipa, and I remember this was my process. Every, it was a 99 and every summer, I had the air cranked to full, and as soon as I hit Ford, I had to turn off the AC in order to make it up the hill. That was tough. That was weird, but because there's only a certain amount of power available for you to do a certain task. But you know what's amazing? When we're in him, that power becomes available for exactly what God has designed you to do. And today being in him is being in touch with the power that's going to help you accomplish the one thing he's asking you to do. Let's go to 1 John. And while you go there, 1 John chapter 2, um, let me just give you the background of what's happening in 1 John. In 1 John, basically, John is the same John that wrote the book of John, the gospel of John, uh, wrote the book of Revelation, and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, different letters. And he's addressing something that is very common in our day. Um, basically, he's fighting against people who are teaching against the knowledge of Jesus and the spirit of the Antichrist. And he's saying, there's so much false teaching going around. And I want you, children, to get the truth. I want you to hear the truth that really comes from, from God. Because John was so close to Jesus. I mean, he's the one that the Word of God says that was leaning on Jesus. He is the only one that showed up when Jesus was being crucified. It was that John. So So John understands love, and John understands relationship, and John understands that the church is being lied to. So he is fighting for them and saying, please, please believe what I'm trying to tell you. Believe what I'm writing to you today. There is power in God, and there is truth in God with a small, interesting word. 1 John 2.27 says the following, but the anointing, can you say anointing tonight? 
the anointing. I want you to keep that in mind. But the anointing which you have received from him, from him, abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing, once again, that spirit of God, that power of God, teaches you concerning all things, it is true and it is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Wow, John unpacks an amazing thing. He's saying there is something called anointing. And it's so interesting because that word is thrown around a lot in Christian circles. But anointing is such an important word in the word of God. And, uh, you know, when people are not Christian, I think I share this with you, but it's a funny story. My, my wife's family are 90% Christians from, you know, great-great-grandpa on down. And so one day when grandpa... Jack died, which is my mother-in-law's father. We all went to the funeral. I mean, this guy was a hero of, of the family. This guy was a missionary in South America in the 50s and 60s and 70s through all the revolution and all that happened. I mean, this guy, he was really the hero of faith in, the, in my wife's family. And so we go to this funeral, and one of my wife's cousins is married to a guy who's a newly Christian, and so his name's David, and so we're at the funeral, and everybody, they're passing the mic, and the grandchildren, right? Oh, Grandpa left us a wonderful mantle, and the mantle of God, he left us, and the next uncle, and everybody, and he gets to David, and he leans over to his wife, and said, hey, what's a mantle, and how come we didn't get one, you know? <laughs> And so sometimes when we're Christians, we just throw a concept around and nobody knows what that really means or how it works. But anointing is so powerful. And for the purpose of this message, it could be many things. It's really the available power of God for a particular task. Anointing is the available, the available power of God for a particular task. When God is asking you to do something, he will anoint you with a particular power to do that task he's called you to do. It is manifested through the gifts. You see people that do certain things. We say, oh, he has a, a grace for something. He has an anointing for something. There is something that he got from him to do a particular job. And that, my friends, we all have access to. And first, John is saying, John is saying, listen, this is true. And this anointing, this spirit, this power can guide you to so many things in your life because anointing is the available power of God for a particular task. And that's why you see things like Billy Graham, who no one sins. Probably Reinhard Bonnke is the closest thing to doing what Billy Graham did. There was a particular anointing for Billy Graham to just bring people to Christ. That's, that's beautiful. There's a particular power for the task at hand. Everybody knows the rock church is a soul winning church. There's a particular power for us to do that. We make it available and God drops it and brings the people by many or by few. He always does. Are you with me today? And it's so important that we understand this because anointing is a beautiful thing. You can't make it up. It's just there. But John is saying it's found in him. Is found in him, not outside of him, not somewhere else. It's found in him. So let's dive in and let's see what happens because that available power is so amazing. As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, Elisha was going to give, somebody was asking a word of God to Elisha. Say, Elisha, we need a word from God. We're being attacked. And so Elisha told the other two kings who were corrupt, said, you two, I don't even want to see. But because of Jehoshaphat, because of this particular king, I will go ahead and get a word from God for you guys. So these other guys were not walking in Christ. And he's like, you're not getting a word from me. I don't really care what happens to you. But this guy's walking with the Lord. Yet he does something so interesting. He says, bring me a musician. Oh, this is why worship is so powerful. If you read in the word of God, worship is transformation. Worship brings about the power of God. Worship, the worshipers were the ones who go, went up front before the river was open before God. Worship is so important. So when we come to the house of God and we're worshiping together, saying, Jesus, we love you, and we open our hearts, we're inviting that available power of God to start working on our behalf in this particular place. Are you with me, church? This is why it's so crucial. So he invited this musician, says the word of God, that he played and the word of God spoke through Elisha. The same with Saul invited David. Someone said, hey, this spirit is evil is upon me and it said that when David played Saul was at peace. That was an anointing upon that man to do that particular job in that moment. Are you with me today? And it's so important because we as Christians cannot just throw the word around. We have to garner, we have to get that power 
power that's available and really use it on our behalf because it's found in him and he's going to give it to you tonight. Look what David says. Psalm 28, Psalm 28, 7 and 8 says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. Oh, that's wonderful right there. My heart trusted in who? In him. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices. He's saying, I'm finding my help. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to just put it all upon you. And it says, and with my song, I will praise him. David understood the power of that. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to praise you my God, because I'm trusting you, Jesus. I'm trusting you. And I, uh, you know, I do this often, often in my car. I try to play songs before I, I write a message. I, because worship is so powerful, bringing the anointing and the power of God. Verse 8 says, the Lord is their strength. Look at this. And he is the saving refuge of his anointed. David said, God put a particular power in me, and he is the one that's going to save me and walk me through every situation in my life because that anointing is upon him to do that work. That available power is on him to do this work. I want you to look at three things tonight together. Just three things, simple things. I, I don't think I'll take long tonight, and then we'll spend some time with him. Point number one is this, anointing comes from him. You can't fabricate it, you can't make it up, you can try. I come from Pentecostal circles and charismatic circles and sometimes we would do the silliest thing just because we wanted, quote unquote, the anointing. Am I being too real with you? That's what I lived growing up sometimes. Not always, there was powerful services. Please don't misunderstand me. But there was some times where maybe God wanted to take us a certain direction, a tenderness in the spirit, but we were so used to the ramping it up that the only way we could connect to the anointing is if we was ramped up to the hilt and sweat dripping and, and handkerchief flying and then we're in the anointing. <laughs> that's, that's all we knew. Yet that's not always the case because the anointing is not a particular something. The anointing is the available power God for a particular task whatever that task he has asked you to do he will empower you through that process but it comes from him no one can give it to you no one can just be handing it around it comes from him look what John says and John right there to verse uh, chapter 2 says but the anointing which you have received whoa where'd the verse go there you go with the anointing you have received from who yeah. from him abides in you that you have received from him you can't get it from anyone else i always remember the story that dr baron told me when i used to work at isom he said um a particular minister was minister one time and somebody came up to him and touched him and the minister said don't touch me or you're going to take away my anointing i i never forgot that story i was like that's pretty crazy like the anointing comes from him He gave it to you. He puts it on you to keep a particular task. Now, there's a way to muddy it, yes, through sin and doing other things. We're not going to get into that, but there are ways to walk away from it. But touching you is not one way. As a matter of fact, the woman that touched Jesus, instead of taking it away, she got a benefit from it. She knew he got it, I need it, and man, did she receive it. Are you with me today? And it's so powerful, so powerful. It says you received it from him. Jesus talking about a particular prophecy. As a matter of fact, in the book of Luke, if, I don't, if I'm not mistaken, he stands up at, at the service at the synagogue and reads this particular prophecy in Isaiah 61. And then he says, that prophecy has come to light today. Wouldn't that be awesome if you get up and then you read a prophecy and say, that's me, thank you. <laughs> that's what he did. He took a curtain call. And so Jesus said, hey, let me read it for you. Isaiah 61. And he says, that, that's happening before your eyes. Look what he says. Look what he says. Very famous scripture. I'm going to read in the New Living Translation because it simplifies in a beautiful way. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. This is Isaiah prophesying about Jesus. And Jesus says it about himself. It says, for the Lord has anointed me. Can you say that phrase with me? One, two, three. Anointed me. So Jesus is saying, The Lord God gave me a particular power to do something. And then he goes on describing what that particular power is. This is so amazing. He says, here's my anointing. Here's the power available for my task that I bring good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim the captives will be released and the prisoners will be free. And another version says, and they'll receive their, their blinds will receive their eyesight. And then he says, he has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And with it, the day of God's anger against their enemies. So he's saying, there's a power coming that's going to heal you, is going to touch you, is going to prosper you, is going to vindicate you. All was found under the anointing Jesus received. This is so amazing. Continues to saying, verse 3 says, To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for their ashes. Uh, who wants that? I want that. I want something good for all the heap of trouble I received in life. That's what he's saying. Something good. A joyous blessing instead of mourning. Festive praise instead of despair. In the righteousness, there will be like great oaks, it says, and that the Lord has planted for his own what? Glory. So God has done this for his own glory. Listen, when you say, God, I want the anointing, all you're asking is, I want you to give me the available power that is for my task. I don't know what your task is, but you got to ask for that anointing. Is it a mom? Is it to be a better father? Is it to be a better mechanic? Is it to be a better preacher of the word? Whatever it may be, there is an available power for you to do, and you shouldn't just put it aside. I'm always so amazed with my wife because my wife... She says she's not, a, you know, sometimes a good mom, but she has such an anointing to be a mother that is amazing, amazing. I mean, she's an amazing mom, and I've seen her do it so well, and I believe that's an empowerment of God to do so because of her own experience, and that is a powerful thing. Whatever God has given you, you have to put it to use to the max. Don't put it aside. Don't do like me. Don't go to a smaller drill to do a bigger task, or don't have an amazing power tool and then leave it in the garage and sometimes we do that in our connection with Christ point number two today number one is that anointing comes from him and from no one else second thing I want you to know tonight is that his anointing is to help you to know truth his anointing is to help you to know truth I'm going to tell you something I feel more truthful when I'm in the anointing here in the church than anywhere else How do I explain that? Let me explain that to you. When you're in the presence of God, God is going to show you who you really are in him. Who you really are in him. And it's different than what you think you are. And it's always better than what you think you are. Always. He's got a different vision of you. And in the presence of God, it opens up the realm. Because he's going to lead you to truth. As a matter of fact, the same John writes in John 14 that the Spirit of God is the one who's going to lead us to all truth when the Holy Spirit came. That's what Jesus said. He said he's going to show you all truth. That available power. Let's read together in 1 John. Remember, you just got to remember that here there's false teachers and prophets coming into the church. And he's saying, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. So that anointing is already in you. It's already in you. And then he says, you do not need that anyone teach you. He's not saying, don't listen to messages, don't grow up spiritually. But look, he explains it. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning how many things? All things. As the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and it is true and not a lie. Not just biblical truth, but in all things. What is really happening? Why don't we use the available power of God to let that power of God clarify those things? Are you confused in your marriage or in a business? Ask God, ask the power, the available power of God to lead you through this process. Lord, what do you want me to do? Because he's going to lead you to all truth in all things he's going to tell you the truth and not lie to you and that is so important my friends because today in our day and age in our society i think we people enjoy themselves living through things and not really living life as it is we all understand it social media has taken over the world people take other personas people say stuff on facebook they will never tell you to their face but they feel so in power when they're ready to hit the keys And so he's saying, listen, I'm going to lead you to all truth, and I'm going to tell you the reality of where you're at and what's going on. And that is the filter you need in your life, the anointing of God letting you know who you really are in him and in no one else. Are you with me today? That's who you really are. God is going to do that for you. And in your life, you have to, you have to allow God to do that. Filter all those things. Filter the stuff that was said about you and all that and say, God, 
who am I really through your power for the available task that you have for me? Because that's the anointing that we need today in this moment, in this day. And as a matter of fact, the anointing is so powerful and so wonderful. There's a story in the Word of God that is so amazing. Um, we're not going to read it today. I'm just going to mention it to you. But I believe the Apostle Paul was preaching and some guy saw what the Apostle Paul was doing, healing people through the anointing. People were getting saved and delivered. And so they come up to, the, could they come up to uh, Paul and says, hey, man, give us what you got. I mean, they were willing to pay money to have anointing. Whoa, that's how powerful it is. They were willing to buy it. They were willing to get it. How do I get that? So Paul says, hey, that's not for me. That comes from him. So they go and said, man, this guy didn't give us. We're going to try it. So they used the formula. Are you with me? Let's ramp it up, wave the handkerchief, and then the anointing is going to fall. So they go use the formula, and they go on the guy, and they say, hey, you know what? We're going to cast out this demon. And they have at it. The demon comes out and says, man, who are you guys? The demon says, I know Paul, and I know Jesus. You? I have no idea who you guys are. I'm going to back in. And so they went back in. The guy couldn't set them free, you know, but... Um, but the reality is that you can't buy the anointing. You can't produce this stuff. You can't just fabricate it. You have to know that it leads you to all truth because it's the available power of God for a particular task in your life. What is this, that task? How do I get that task? How do I grow in it? How do I do this? How do I make it available in my own life? Because I believe in nowadays, we need more and more the power of God being more manifested in everything we do. In everything we do, my friends, in everything we do, we need that available power. People need to see that anointing at your desk at work. People need to see that. They need to know, man, you're different. You have something. We're going to walk in a certain way. They need that. Our world today needs that because you know what? It's becoming darker on one end, but the word of God says that the light will shine even brighter when that happens. The light will shine brighter. I'm going to tell you something. I have never seen so many Christian athletes except in this Olympics. It's the first time. I love sports, and I've been watching sports since I was a kid. I love sports. Never in my life so many athletes have come out and praised God and said, glory to Jesus, thank you, I'm so grateful. We all know the two swimmers kind of got this started that won the silver for the U.S. in, in a pair platform diving. And so these guys were amazing, amazing. And the first thing said, hey, our identity is not found in medals, but it's found in Jesus. And the world went crazy. Cra like, they just... They just said something horrible on TV. People were, what? They said Jesus. They didn't, say, they didn't talk about themselves. They said, we did this because our identity is found in him. And what an amazing concept. Yeah, give praise to Jesus. He deserves it. What an amazing concept. And it went on from there, athlete after athlete after athlete after athlete. I was amazed. I was amazed. I was like, I've seen sports for a long time. I've never seen that many people vocally said, what I'm doing, I'm doing because God has empowered me to do it. That's beautiful, my friends. The world needs more of that. We need more transformational change. But that anointing comes when him, from him. And number three, and very important for us to know, is that for more anointing, you have to be with him. And here is the important part about being in him. As a matter of fact, Pastor Jim clarified this and gave us a beautiful definition. I, it was my fault. I didn't give it to the guys on the screen. But he said, abide means to live to dwell and to stay. And that is an amazing definition. Abide in him is to live, dwell, and stay. I'll repeat that. Abiding in him is to live, to dwell, and to stay. If you can do those things, if you can remain in God, in that state, in that position, there's something that's going to grow in you. You cannot get it outside of that. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just be honest and challenge you in your walk with God. You want more power from God, you're going to have to be with God. There's no other way. Here's how John expresses this. Here's what he's saying. And, and John 2, verse 27, part B, this is what he says. Give me the part B, the last part. He says, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, we already know that he's teaching you, and it's true, and it is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, it says, it's already teaching you, you will abide where? In him. He's saying, you want this amazing power and you want to know truth, you're going to have to remain in God. You're going to have to live, you're going to have to dwell, you have to stay in that position in God in everything you do. You have to do that. And so for us to grow in this anointing is so important. Um, there's an expression that says, when you see somebody doing something so effortless, it means that they've worked really hard at it. 
really hard. And we see athletes all the time. We're like, they do things so effortless and it's amazing. We're like, man, how easy. And then we go to the basketball court and we look like fools, you know. It looks so simple on TV. You know, we see baseball players doing amazing things or whatever it is. You know, it took a lot of work. It took years of experience. And for us to grow in that, we have to abide in him. And that's why those guys wanted the power from the Apostle Paul. I want that. But if you read, I believe, Galatians, he talks about, hey, man, I spent 14 years in the desert once I heard the word of God. And then I went to Jerusalem. Uh, That took time in him. See, we want to go to the action right away. Oh, I want to walk and the people will be healed in my shadow. Would you like to spend 14 years in the presence of God? Then you might. We can't get it any other way but being in him. He's going to charge you. He's going to give you. He's going to empower you. He's going to lead you to all truth. He's going to speak to you. He's going to heal those broken parts of your heart. He's going to empower you in other areas that you want to work the things of God. But it all begins being in him. Listen, church. God has a particular task for you that is absolutely powerful. And he's not classifying you, oh, this is educated or not educated. If there's one thing about the rock, we've always kind of pride ourselves and believe that God has people of all walks of life here and that are ready to be using their sphere of influence in every area. We need the anointing to do that more than any other place. And we get it in him in every area possible. It's so powerful. This is a very known scripture in the book of Acts. Um, Paul, um, sorry, Peter, I believe, let me remember. Peter and John, actually. Peter and John were um, with Christ, and they have walked with Christ so beautifully. And in one of those moments, they're ministering, and they're telling them they have to stop ministering and doing those things. And it's so amazing because I want you to hear the response of the people seeing Peter and John minister. I'll read it in the Message Bible because it tells you like a story. That's Acts chapter 4. Verses 13 and 14 in the Message Bible says the following. They couldn't take their eyes off of them. So th- these guys are amazing. They couldn't take their eyes. Peter and John is standing there so confident. Oh, we need confidence in our life. We need confidence for every walk of life that we do, for everything we do. So sure of themselves. This is a, an amazing description. So here's two guys saying, doing something that's amazing in the power. Look at this, look at this. Their fascination deepened when they realized these two were Laymen with no training in the scriptures or formal education. Stop right there. That's why I love the message Bible. Here's the message Bible saying people were, they couldn't get their life off of these guys preaching and doing miracles. And then they would be more fascinated when they realized these guys were just fishermen. They never went to school. They've been working all their life. They don't talk right. They don't write. They don't do anything. They don't know anything. All they know to do is get fish. They're stinky. That's all they know. <laughs> we are powerful, educated people. And they said, but these guys are amazing. Look at the next phrase. They recognize them. Stay on it. Stay on the previous verse. They recognize them as companions of what? Jesus. And another version says, they know they have been with him. With people, the Bible makes it so clear. They were uneducated, workers, low class, but they were doing stuff that people with education, money, and power were like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. One difference, they had been with him. They had been with him. They have been in him and you and I need that in our lives today we're not going to get it from anywhere else education is not bad I love education I'm for education at every level and capacity but I understand that it's not my education that has taken me to do what God is asking me to do because what I do has nothing to do with my education I don't pull teeth on Sundays I was a dentist for some of those that didn't get that joke I preach the word of God, and I can only do that through him. Can't do it any other way. Can't do it any other way. It's nothing to do with my education. It's everything to do with what he wants to do. Continue the story. says, but with the man, I love this. They recognize they're companions of Jesus. But with the man right before them, right before them, there's a guy. Seeing him standing there so upright, so healed, watch this. What could they say against that? And that is the power of God manifested. One is the manifester, there's nothing else to say. So 
what are you going to tell? You can have the highest education. If that person got up from that wheelchair, uh, got up from a wheelchair. There's nothing to do. God is amazing. I want you to watch this video with me. Somebody sent me this link. I read the story, and I've watched it three times, and I wept all, every single time. Here's the story. There's a pastor named Miller. This is related from another pastor who shared this testimony. And so um, there's a pastor named Miller, and this guy got sick. This particular pastor, Miller, got sick with a tough cold, and the cold took away his voice. He raspy voice. He could hardly speak. You will hear him speak in the recording. And so he would talk, barely talk, went to 200 doctors and 64 specialists, and no one had an answer. It got so bad, he had to retire from being a pastor. And so because he knew nothing else, he had to find a job, like a, you know, find a different kind of job to support his family and kids and a job that he didn't have to use his voice. He, his life was upside down. You would think, here's a guy who, a uh, man who's serving God, who's doing everything for God. You would think that something amazing was going to happen. We see so many healings in the Bible, and this is so important why we have to be in him. This is so important. I want you to get this. I want you to get this. Why we have to be in him. And so this pastor, Miller, retires from pastoring, gets a job, but he doesn't walk away from God. He doesn't get bitter and frustrated. He is sad, obviously. He doesn't have a voice anymore. And he joins another church because they moved to a different town. And in, he, they join a large church like ours. And he was kind of hidden in the back. I have no voice, but I, I want to be in God. I want to be in him. One day, one day, somebody knows about his past as a pastor and asks him, hey, Mr. Miller, would you teach our Sunday school class? And the class that particular day was on healing. And he's like, you know, you would hear his voice. I, you know. And he's like, well, I'm not sure. Finally, he says, okay, I'll do it. And he's teaching from Psalm 103, which is my favorite psalm. Every time I do a hospital visit, I read it because it's my favorite psalm. It's an amazing psalm. I recommend it for you. Psalm 103. I want you to hear this amazing thing. As he is teaching, God heals his voice. Watch the video. Of course, here he is with this voice. And so he's, he's saying, you know, God forgives all our sins, but he doesn't always heal our diseases. And I want you to listen to this audio tape, Pastor Dwayne Miller. So when the psalmist writes, and he heals all of my diseases, let me say to you that I believe God still heals. That hasn't ended. That is not over. Now you have to be careful on how you do this. Because there are folks who carry things to an excess, and it becomes a show. And God has never intended that that be what it is. God heals in his sovereign will. I don't know why God does things that he does, but I know that he does. And the only thing he requires of me is to allow him to be God and me to be me and let it be. To say that every single person will always be healed because Jesus died on the cross is a misinterpretation of scripture. Not true. Won't work. Isaiah 53 doesn't talk about physical healing. I'm sorry. That's just not the context. And to impress that there causes a misinterpretation of scripture. That's wrong. On the other hand, to say that since we don't have anything after the book of Acts, that miracles ended at the book of Acts and they never happen again is equally as wrong. Because you have put God in a box both ways. And he doesn't want to be in the box. So, the psalmist says, I'm excited. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. One of his benefits is he heals all of my diseases. And then in verse 4 he says, and he redeems my life from the pit. Now, I like that verse just a whole lot. I have had, and you have had in times past, pit experiences. We've both had, we've all had times when our life seemed to be in a pit, in a grave. And we didn't have an answer for the pit we find ourselves in. And I don't understand this right now. 
I'm a bit overwhelmed at the moment. I'm not quite sure what to say or do. <laughs> I'm uh, <laughs> sounds funny to say at a loss for words. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I <sighs> He redeems my life from the pit <laughs> and crowns me with love and compassion. He satisfies my desires with good things. <laughs> so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. The Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is abounding in love. The Lord will not accuse, nor will He harbor His anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. That's mercy. Or repay us according to our iniquities. That's mercy. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as He removed our transgressions from us. So powerful. Because in the end, the available power of God wants to be manifested in every area of our lives. And we have to allow Him. And it only happens when we're in Him. Pastor Miller had every right to be upset with God. He had every right to tell God, I served you, and this is what you do to me. Yet he chose to remain in Him. And God, eventually, in His kindness and mercy, and in His timing, did something amazing. Because anointing, i s not a power for us to show off or do great things. Anointing is the available power of God for something He's asking you to do today. And everyone, when I read the Word of God, did it. See, Adam needed him to complete his task. Noah needed him to save a planet. Abraham needed him to complete the promise. Moses needed him to free Israel. David needed him to lead Israel. Esther needed him to save her people. Isaiah needed him to prophesy about his coming. Mary needed him in order to serve for his purposes. And he, Jesus, is the embodiment of power and anointing in each one of us. The disciples needed him. And you and I need him tonight. Desperately need him tonight. We can go out of this place and do great things, but we're not going to accomplish anything purposeful without Him and being in Him. And tonight, I want to give you a time to really connect with Him. And this is the time we're going to do that. Would you stand with me tonight? Just stand right there. I'm going to lower the lights a little bit, and I'm going to open the altar if you want. But here's what I want to drive at you. This is for all of us. God has a particular task for you. And you've been asking him for power in that area. Listen, you're not going to get it outside of him tonight. You need him. I need him. And I want us, before we leave this place, to leave with a touch from God in every area of our lives. That we would honor him today and saying, I love you, Jesus. I'm so desperate for you. I need you tonight. And I want to give you a moment. I'm going to open the altars. They're open right now. If you want to come forward and say, God, I I so desperately need you. I want you tonight. The team is going to be singing right now because God is going to empower you tonight with that anointing. He's going to give you that particular power for that task. Go ahead, team, and lead us in prayer tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you.
Jesus. God, I pray for my brother and sister, for every one of us today, Lord. I know you have assigned us a task in our own life. Whatever that may be, we're asking, Lord God, that we remain in you so that way we have the power to accomplish that we have called us, Lord God. And John, better than anybody, tells us it is in you that we find it. It is in you. It is living and staying and dwelling in you that we're going to find it. So I pray for each one of my brothers and sisters, Lord, today, that they get that from you. That we be endued with power from above to do what you're asking us to do. That beautiful anointing, that available power of God to do that purpose in us. And tonight, Lord, we receive it. And we say back that we love you with all of our hearts and all of our lives. Can we do that one more time, church? Just sing it. Jesus, I love you. Yes, we love Let them hear and say it with your voice. And oh, how we love you. You are the one God, you. Our hearts adore Tell them one more time, Jesus. one more time, Jesus. Jesus, we love you. Yes, we do. Know oh, how we love you. You are the one. First John chapter 2 verse 28 John ends by telling us the following he says and now little children abide in him and here's the reason why that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming you know what Jesus is saying you're my boy you're my girl and the moment I show up you don't have to be ashamed I'm going to love you. I'm going to empower you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to lead you to where you have to be. That is his desire for us today. Can we give him a hand tonight? He deserves it. Thank you, Father. You're so good and so faithful, Lord. You're so wonderful. And you won't be ashamed of us. Amen. Remain standing. Remain standing. You can go back to your seats if you need to. It's okay. Remain standing for five minutes. I want to ask a very important question. If there's anyone here tonight, as you're there, is there anyone here tonight and you have not given your heart to the Lord and you're saying, Pastor, I heard what you said. I'm hearing what you're preaching. I understand those things that you are saying today, but I'm not really walking with God. Today is your time to change the direction of your life. 
See, because you cannot get the purpose that God has for you unless you begin with a relationship with God. Here's how he says it in the word of God. Here's how he says it. He says, I am knocking at the door. And if anyone opens, I will walk in and dine with him and he with me. You know what he's saying? If you hear what I'm asking you to do, I'm going to be in your life forever. That's what he wants to do. God sent his only begotten son to a cross and died for you because he loves you. But he's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself into you. He's not going to force you to be a Christian. The law says we're a Christian nation. You have to be. No. We believe we're Christian because we've gone to church or because we've done a bunch of things. As a matter of fact, we, we believe the craziest thing. You know the toughest Latino gangster have a Virgin Mary in their chest? And they write Jesus and tattooed it in their skin? And unless they have Christ in their heart, they're not going anywhere. This is not a, I represent. This is a, I have in him. I have abided in him. I've surrendered myself to him. I've humbly asked him to forgive me. And I humbly want to repent of my sins. That's what God is asking you today. And if you're not in God, today is a challenge for you. A wonderful challenge. A challenge of faith. Here's what we would like you to do when he wants you to do. In a moment, I'm going to invite anyone who has not done this who has not given their heart to christ who have not made christ their lord and savior who have not made jesus the center of their life to take a step of faith in a moment i'm going to invite those who haven't done that to step out of their aisle out of their seat and meet me right here pastor what do i have to do that can we just pray in our seats it should be wonderful just there nobody knows here's why because the word of god says you have to take a step of faith he says if you acknowledge me before men I will acknowledge you before the Father. But if you deny me and say, that's not for me, I don't want that. He says in his word, I will deny you. He doesn't want to deny you. We just read in John. He says, when I come, I don't want you to be ashamed. But it only happens when Christ is abiding in your heart. It doesn't happen anywhere else. That is the challenge today. If you've never done this prayer, and in a moment I want to include you in that prayer, and you want to be included, today is your moment to walk and meet me right here. If you did this prayer but walked away from God, Pastor, I did that prayer one time, but I never went back to church. I really didn't pray, didn't connect with God. Restart your relationship with God today. If you feel the knocking of the Lord in your heart today, today is your moment to take a step of faith, get out of the aisle, and meet me right here today. That is your moment. If that is you and God is knocking at your door, I want you to come tonight and I'll meet you right here and let's pray together. Would you lead us in a song? As he's singing, just step out of the aisle. Says, my turn tonight. I'm ready to give my heart to the Lord. He's inviting you. He's not to shame you. Nobody's going to force you, but you have to decide that. Go ahead. Jesus, sweet As he sings, this is your moment. Thank you, Father. Oh, how we love God is saying there's many more of you we're just going to continue to worship and it's your moment just like they were bold and said I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to go to Christ God is inviting you to step out of your seat and say I need you tonight put aside your pride your heart what your mind is telling you hey I can't do that I'm not sure if I want to do that but your heart is telling you I'm ready listen to your heart because that's God knocking at your door as they sing this song again you come and meet me right here and we'll pray together.
can't force you, but I know what the Spirit of God is telling me. And I have a few minutes. If you're a Christian, please be mature and help me by praying. I'm going to let you go home in a minute, but there are souls at stake. These guys are here are broken. These guys are legit. They're saying, God, I need you tonight. And God is asking you, you need me. Please don't put me aside. Please don't. Put, I love you so much. I don't want to shame you, but you have to take the step. I'll do it one last time. If that's you. You know God is asking you to take this step. I'm inviting you tonight to meet me right here. And we'll pray together. And we'll invite Jesus in your heart. No matter what happens, just say, God, I'm ready for this. I, I really need to do this. God is inviting you. Now is the moment to do it. Jesus, we love Thank you, Lord. You. Oh, how we love you. Oh, your presence is here, Lord. You are the telling you what the spirit is saying to me there's many more of you guys you might walk out of here tonight and say hey i avoided that but i'm seeing what god is seeing in your future and he's saying man forget the religion forget the church forget the structure of what people tell you what church is and give me give god an opportunity in your heart that's what he wants that's what he wants he's inviting you tonight i'm going to pray with these guys right here but if you're one of those you still have a moment to come hey if you're up here Put a smile on your face. I know you're broken and you're humble. You're saying, God, man, I heard that and I want to give you my all. That's awesome. Today we're going to pray together. Can we pray with them tonight? And we're going to say a prayer. The book of Romans says that when you say that prayer, listen to this, something happens in your heart. You say it with your mouth, but you believe it in your heart. And something new begins in each one of your heart. That's what the word of God says. So let's do it together. Repeat with me. Say, Jesus, I invite you to my heart. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins the wrongdoings I've committed against you. I ask you today to wash me clean with the blood of your son Jesus and let me walk in the future you have for me. From this day forward, I belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. To give him a hand. Wow. Listen, what an amazing thing. Here's what I want you to do. Pastor Joel, one of our leaders and our pastor here, he wants to do a few things with you. If you want more prayer, there'll be people that pray with you, but he's going to offer you a friend. Somebody that's going to lead you to know how to get strong in Christ so you don't go back to the things you've been doing. And he's going to offer you a book, an SPT along with that, that explains what I've done tonight and how do I move forward in Christ. This is the first step to an amazing future. Let him explain to you how do you do that, okay? Follow him and he'll get that to you. Five minutes of your time and you can come back right away. Thank you. Just go with him and follow him for five minutes, and he'll bless you. Thank you so much. Give him a hand. Christ is it. Thank you, Lord. We're in you, Father. Amen.